all these sword ferns. So lucky to have them, the, just the green foliage all winter. I grew up in Central Europe and you know, the green is often gone in the winter. And, and just out here, it's just so beautiful. And especially the sword fern and the salal, of course, and the um, Oregon grape. The problem is you don't always see your mushrooms as well when there's all this ground cover. But you know, we get a glimpse and here I got a glimpse and uh, so there's a little purplish mushroom. Which is a fiber cap. So the fiber caps is quite a big genus. Inosibi, I, I know, is fiber. Sibi is the cap, all Greek here. And this used to be Geophila variation Lilancina and now it has it got its own name so that was probably a European name and now it got its own name is what was that creamy um, just looked it up online the new name here we go Polydi Crema so I know also be Polydi Crema poly for pale I guess or swamp and crema for the cream and um, these fiber caps are ectomycorrhizal. They are root associated, especially out here, many of them with Douglas firs. And um, some of them have a quite strange odor. So let me see what I'm getting out of this guy. Yeah, there it is. So this is a spermatic odor. Um, maybe, you know, dozen or two dozens of species of, of fiber caps have this quite unique odor which you might find also with berberis and rowan trees they go that direction as well and that's quite helpful for identifying them they often have a pointed cap and the cap has fine fibers let's see if we see a little more mature version of this thing up oh, there's one and there is a young one so you see how the color changes through age. So when young, the, the purple is really pronounced and uh, with change of water content and with uh, stretching of the cap, uh, you know, the pigments just get, well, watered down is definitely not the right term when we're talking about drying out, but then they lose the intensity. And what's very typical for fiber caps is that they break radially. So from the center, they break open in radial directions um, and um, and then on the cap you can see there's like very fine fibers um, I think there was another fiber cap down there there's another one um, which looks quite different but the fiber thing and the radially breaking is also um, you know when you just look at these things you think huh why are they the same genus but um, this is another fiber cap and you see also how it breaks radially and you can see fine fibers on the cap this one has some fine scales as well and um, they are brown spored often they have white gills but then when they're mature you see the the spore color colors the gills so that's a quite a common phenomena so when you see a young one you wouldn't know it's brown spored um, but uh, once the spores are mature, then they leave their color on the gills. Now the odor again. Yeah, it's a little bit spermatic here too. I don't know which species yet. I would need to look it up. There's, there's quite a big diversity. And actually the founder of Puget Sound Mycological Society, or one of the co-founders, uh, and our first scientific uh, advisor, uh, Dr. Daniel Stunz, um, he was an expert for Inosibi, and he was writing a monograph. Everybody would have, if somebody takes on such a difficult, diverse genus of little brown mushrooms, you know, everybody is very grateful. Unfortunately, he died before he, he finished. So that was a real big loss for Inosibi, and now people straightening it out with DNA. But um, huge, huge genus, lots of diversity, and all of them toxic. So, um, don't know if it's all of them, but many of them have muscarin and muscarin uh, a toxic that will um, let you 
um, ooze liquid out of every orifice you have and it's really unpleasant and um, it can kill little kids and uh, sickish elderly people but uh, if you have a healthy strong system muscarin will not take you out but um, so nobody eats that uh, eats any of these things and uh, the only problems we have is uh, people looking for little brown mushrooms with uh, with fairy dust, um, they might end up picking these things uh, wrong. They're looking for psychedelics. You know? Right, when they're looking for psychedelics, oh look there's blue in there, this got to be it, right? No, no, no. Um, the blue staining of psychedelics is a whole different issue than, uh, you know, a purple mushroom, uh, like we, the purple mushroom we have here. So, inosibi, the fiber caps. Ooh, what do I see here? Check that out. That gotta be an Amanita. Ooh, yeah, and look at that nice vulva on the base. Wow. So that sack here, that was part of the universal veil. Part of the universal veil, you see also here on the cap, see that parts of tissue? That was connected to this thing here, and that was one bag that enclosed the whole mushroom before it stretched and grew. And, um, so whenever you see a vulva on the base of a mushroom, you know, well, you have a 95% or 99% chance, 95, that you have an Amanita, especially when it has a slender stem and um, doesn't grow on wood. And, yeah. So we talked about the universal veil, how it holds everything. Then another part is often there's a ring and the ring on the Amanita comes from the partial veil, which before the cap, opens fully up, it is covered by a partial veil and that might end up as a ring around the stem or a piece of tissue. Sometimes it can hang also on the edge of the cap. Um, so several ways how a partial veil can uh, end up. So when it comes to veils, Amanitas uh, have it all and um, many of them are quite toxic. Some are even deadly like the death cap or death angel. Uh, luckily uh, these two species are not native here and not been recorded in Bridal Trail. And, uh, but like this guy here, which uh, we call so far Amanita Jamada group, there are several species under that name. And it's a European species, so it will get a new name. Um, these are closely related to the fly agaric. And the fly agaric is that red mushroom with the white dots. And also the same shape can get much bigger. Um, and these are all toxic mushrooms. Is that fly agaric the one that that the elves use when they dismount from the elfin saddles <laughs> and sit on the top of a mushroom? I think that's more the humans when they try to turn into elfins, you know. Um, but it's 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 a mushroom. Uh, the the fly agaric will poison you to a degree that your mind says, "I'm out of your body for a while," you know. Um, this is really not very uh, enjoyable and out of the body I feel better and um, if the person who's working with these things is smart enough and doesn't do it in the winter where the body might freeze meanwhile um, they come back in their bodies and do better afterwards. Um, so yes, Amanita gemata, ectomycorrhizal, so it is uh, root associated, Douglas fir, hemlock, um, you know also all the members of the oak family and birches and cottonwoods also have Amanita on their roots. So they are very um, uh, versatile, huge genus and many of them toxic and some of them choice edibles, but we have very few of the choice edibles in the Pacific Northwest. So in general, we do not mess with uh, Amanita uh, as a source of food. Amazing, huh? How many mushrooms? Yeah, the season is really coming, peaking now. Ah, look at all my friends here. I don't really know if they're my friends. Well, I guess I'm their friend and they don't probably don't care about me. Um, if I try to eat them, um, I get very different messages. So what we look at, uh, we look at most of these mushrooms here are two groups, uh, two different uh, mushrooms. So we have these bright um, 
white edged beige tan mushrooms these guys here um, which are uh, probably uh, leucopaxillus um, leuco for white paxillus for a different mushroom and when you look at the leucopaxillus um, the gills tight gills white sport uh, these are lots of little springtails here who apparently lacking a taste for bitter because um, when you taste these guys Oh, so bad. It's like bitter, metallic, what's the other taste? I mean... In other words, they suck? <laughs> they don't like me. Really intense unpleasant taste so I'm sure nobody gets well I shouldn't say I'm sure there's always some people who manage to eat something like that and think it's a it's it's a really bad tasting mushroom and uh, so leucopaxillus and the leucopaxillus when you look here at the soil look at all this here so incredible amount of mycelium um, and this mycelium here I mean there's no guarantee this is this mushroom you know but pretty surely is because they have big mycelia and they um, they are saprobic mushrooms so they decay that kind of biomass and then you know when you have a fruiting like this uh, at the right time of the year they put out the fruiting bodies to produce their millions of spores so this is a, a leucopaxillus um, don't know exactly which species Chantianaeus comes to mind, um, but I don't know. And then we have a very different mushroom here, uh, these velvety caps. Oh, here, yeah, that's the thing. If you talk about you have mushrooms in your forest and all kinds of people come in and they cut the mushrooms and they don't take them with them. You know, it's like, hey, um, you can feel from above if it's a soft, a soft mushroom and it's a little too old to enjoy, don't destroy it because it still can produce spores probably for another three five days or maybe even a week and so this way cutting it is really not helpful so be a little bit more discerning when you cut your mushrooms um, when you pick them and don't just you know kill the ones you don't take with you and these are bullets so bullets are mushrooms um, that have that have a sponge that have tubes down below and uh, the beautiful red stem and the yellow sponge and then the velvety uh, dark brown blackish cap uh, that uh, tells us it's a cerro comelus cerro is uh, dry comelus is for hairy and um, so little dry velvet uh, velvet cap will lead and then the red on the stem and only a little bit of blue staining so this is uh, now Cerocomelus atropurpureus and till a year ago officially it was Cerocomelus um, celeri but um, it turned out that celeri is a really rare uh, Cerocomelus and DNA told us that you know 95% of what we call what we thought is Cellus bullet turns out to be this kind the Atro Pupureus. so um, celery still exists but it's hard it's rare and these guys are quite enjoyable especially when they're young and firm once they get a little old there's you know they get too mushy but young they are firm uh, mild taste and um, a little bit lemony not all of them so that's curious to find out here That one is not too lemony. So sometimes they're a little, little sour, but in a pleasant way. And that one is just mild fungal. And there's plenty of mushrooms you should never eat raw. So, but we know a few of them, uh, it's, it's not a big issue. And um, I wouldn't eat 10 of these guys raw. I have no idea what happens then, but I've eaten one or two or three of the little guys raw and I never had a problem. So I go by that, um, but King bullets, we know you can eat raw. Most people can without a problem. But you know, like morels or, or, or parasols, many mushrooms, uh, if you eat them raw, you get sick. So you always have to assume that a mushroom, that a mushroom is 
toxic when raw, unless you know the opposite. Is there a common name for that? I wished we had a good common name, you know, and then we have uh, mycologists to work years to give a name and come up with a scientific name, but never think about what do we, what a common name should we come up. So the Cerocomelus, I think Velvet Bullet is, is a pretty good name, but then when you have dark purple Velvet Bullet, if you translate, translate the scientific name, that's just too long. So I'm, I'm, Jim, if you come up with a good name for that thing, um, I'll, I'll put it in my book, okay? I mean, we have the closely related red cracking bullet, where the cap, it's, it's paler. It's quite similar, but the cap is paler, and when it crack, it cracks the cap, and it gets a little dry and old, and then the red color shows. That one doesn't do that. So, um, you know, and a and, and term like atropurpureus, dark purple, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, give it one, say dark or purple. Yeah, here the reddish tone. So this is part how we how we also tell the. Um, I would guess this is still the same mushroom, just aging, and the red in the purple is in the description, so that they have more of a red tone than the sellers believe would would do. Um, but it's there's a little bit of red showing here too. So, um, anyways, that's too good to throw away. Um, so the velvet. Bullet and this kind the purple velvet bullet something gotta go it gotta be a little shorter you know to make sense as a good name so we have here these two mushroom mushrooms growing right in between each other and yes they have different colors one has gills the other one has uh, a sponge or tubes but what's really the big difference is one of them is saprobic um, and the other one is mycorrhizal. So the bullet here works with the trees and it's not gonna be the, hem um, the red cedar I'm sitting under. The red cedar does not have ectomycorrhizal partners. They have apuscular mycorrhizals that don't grow such big fruiting bodies. But it is uh, one of the Douglas firs around us where the roots reach here. And so on the roots of the Douglas fir or the hemlock, um, these bullets are connected to them and they feed the tree and the tree feeds them. While these guys here, uh, the Leucopexillus, um, is just digesting the, that biomass here. And yes, it can have an affinity to the biomass of a certain tree that it is especially, uh, you know, likes to break down the foliage of the, the red cedar. So such things can happen, but there is not a direct connection between the mycelium of the, the Leucopexillus and uh, a specific tree around them. Who goes cap? You know, is that well? There's a youngster, and that looks much more like. You know, if I just knew. You're wondering whether there's all right. Yeah, if that is. <laughs> okay, here yeah, I'm looking at a whole bunch of Douglas firs around me, and yes, there is. Look at that patch here, of these velvety cap bleeds. Oh, what beauty! You know. And you can see we are not the only ones appreciating them. See all these little marks here? That must be a little mouse, some kind of a rodent that's um, coming here and feeding and going for the protein. I just love, you know, when I, I wish I could watch them when they eat that. The squirrels are fairly easy to observe eating mushrooms, but you know, other small critters, uh, it's, it's so rare to see here. The mice are out mostly at night. Yeah, so. yeah. So they got to be careful during the day. This thing here, that's really tiny, tiny teeth that enjoy and go for that fungal protein. Yeah, so I'm not going to eat that one now because if somebody else has eaten it on, on it already, um, you know, that makes it a little iffy. In the frying pan, I wouldn't mind because it gets disinfected, but, you know, in the forest. 